Hello everybody, it's Classic David with yet another podcast. Uh, Curtis is here with me. Hello, Curtis. Hi, David. So, uh, just like every two weeks, we are here doing our one hour and today we're going to discuss lots of interesting uh, topics. Uh, we will, however, start with the updates of the usual stuff that we talk about, which is Bitcoin, S&P 500, gold, this time we will include ruble and we will have a look at what ruble is a Russian ruble is doing. Um, then we will talk about the Russian banks removed from SWIFT and also we will relate it to the uh, Canadian bank freezes. Right. So uh, Curtis, why don't you start with the uh, Bitcoin updates? Sure. Okay. Um, if you can, yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. So sim simple chart. Um, so not i'm not a technical analyst of course but mm -hmm. um you do sort of pick these things up as you as you pay attention for a few years you start to understand mm -hmm. some of the basics but so just to explain the chart this is the bitcoin price of course you can see the top line across the top is at 45k mm -hmm. and the bottom one is at 30k mm -hmm. okay um you also have a descending channel or a descending um pattern there so mm -hmm. i just wanted to give this as an overview just my two cents is that it seems like a 45k is resistance right now mm -hmm. um the 45k has been hit twice now on the way up uh, off of the bottom and you can mm -hmm. see looking back into earlier 2021 we had it as both support and resistance. So if you go back to March, yeah, mm -hmm. in March there you see support. Um, in September, mm -hmm. over in September, you see it as support. Oh, okay. In mm -hmm. there you see a lot of support mm -hmm. um, and uh, some resistance as well. Look at October, there's resistance there. So, so anyways, 45K seems pretty critical on the upside. Um, at the bottom, 30K remains the, the sort of do or die level. Um, and we haven't revisited 30K for quite a while. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what yeah. it does show, it looks like we've broken that downward trend though, right? Okay. So mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. high of around 68K, we went down and bottomed at about 32.5. And it looks like that's been broken um question is where do we go from here so do we uh test to the top at 45k or do we try to go down lower um it's hard to know on that um but uh, to me anywhere between 30 and 45k is kind of purgatory it's a, sort of a no man's land mm -hmm. um if we break above the 45k that's quite bullish and we might go up into the 50s below 30k remains the disaster level where you probably have a lot more selling off Probably yes, probably yes. So that's where we're at. Anything from your side on there? Uh, okay, I will switch to the live chart uh, of Bitcoin. This is daily uh, on daily. And interesting is that uh, two weeks ago when we had our previous uh, podcast, it was on 21st of February, we were at exactly the same level. We were like, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, exactly the same. So we have literally just moved sideways since then. And to me, what I'm seeing from this, from the whole picture, and also given the sentiment and given everything, of course, uh, the wars can uh, break the usual sentiment and technical stuff. The wars, the, the events like this can render them uh, ineffective. The, yes. So uh, you have to keep, we have to keep that in mind that we have to rely on them a little bit less. But if I was to rely on the sentiment and on the, all the other stuff that I'm seeing also from different indicators like long and short ratio and overall sentiment what I'm you know seeing, I would say that we are we are actually uh, we are looking pretty good actually. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying that we can go a little bit lower, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it uh, uh, later with relation to the S and P 500. Okay. Um, just quick look at then on-chain data, some two basic charts okay. we're following. Mm -hmm. So this is coins on exchanges, continues to fall. Uh, I think we just hit another all-time low. Um, so the purple line 
is the number of coins being held on exchanges. And you can see it's falling steadily and um, at all time lows. It, it mm-hmm. tends to suggest tends to suggest that people are holding a lot of coins uh, in cold wallets off the exchanges, and it tends to be a bullish a bullish indicator. Yeah, it, um, it perhaps mm-hmm. has something to do with the banning of the Russian uh, users from certain centralized exchanges. Could be. Uh, fortunately, not all of them. Fortunately, like uh, the Binance giant, I think expressed that it just it doesn't make sense to ban the Russian users. Of course, it's sanctioning the the Russian oligarchs, which are uh, who are on the list, but right. not just unilaterally unilateral ban on the Russian IP. Like it doesn't really make sense. I, I've heard yeah, some but people some saying. Um, mm-hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. Sorry. I... No, saying um, back to this chart, like um, I've heard people on Twitter saying things like they don't think this particular uh, data is useful because people can quickly switch from cold storage to back onto exchanges, right? That said, if you look back, mm. look back to, uh, let's say, March of 2020, right? Okay, that's March, here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right there. So that's like 3 million coins were on exchanges, right? Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. now we're at what, 2.3? So we're about 33% lower, right? Uh, if you look at mm-hmm. today, today we're yes. below the 2.4 million. So um, let's say that's a 25% reduction in mm-hmm. supply on exchanges. I think that's pretty significant. Um, you know, all of the things being equal, that shows that a lot of coins have left the exchanges and are not coming back, right? Well, uh, yeah, people can uh, deposit them back, but uh, I don't think They're that not. I don't think that uh, people would just deposit them and panic sell. I think if people would be looking to sell, they would st- start first depositing them and then be prepared yeah. to sell. But they so, haven't moved them back to exchanges. No, look, no, no. Not, I also think that's uh, look yeah. at all of 2021. I mean, look at January 2021, right? Mm-hmm. Since then, it's about the same, much lower. Yeah. Yes. It's uh, 600,000 coins less than uh, 2019 and 2020, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So, I mean, people could, in quotation, right? They could, but they're not doing it. And they haven't been doing it for almost a year and a half. They are not preparing to sell at least. Yeah. They're, and and, it's, um, and, and then, it's not that likely that they will just deposit and panic sell in one day. You know, that, that also, yeah. That this would just um, skyrocket to 3 yeah. million coins and... It makes sense though, it's like unlike, if, uh, unlikely. if uh, you know, micro st- strategy, Michael Saylor is buying, you know, hundreds of coins and um, GBTC is buying hundreds of coins, right? The mm-hmm. big, um, you can, it, it makes sense that those coins are leaving the exchanges and going into private holdings, right? Yeah. Um, but it's been a year and a half where the coin supply has been much lower. And I think that's significant. Okay, and yes. then the next one is the miners. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is the miners' wallets, and the purple line shows miners continue to hold uh, more and more coins um, since the sell-off in January of 2021, the big drop there. Since then, it's been building up, and it continues. So again, it's been a year, almost a year and a half. Let's say a year and three, two months of increased hodling by the minor wallets mm-hmm. the only massive yeah. selling of the miners mm-hmm. was actually in q4 2020 which is interesting yeah. as we were approaching the all-time high and uh, in that period the miners just uh, somehow were convinced that that was gonna be uh the top for now and uh yeah that was uh, the most massive sale yeah what we can see. so both this and the previous graph again they tend to suggest a fairly strong market um, hash rate, I didn't send you hash rate, but that's also mm-hmm. at, at a near all time high. Um, yeah, we, we have to look at that now, but okay. Um, uh, let me maybe let me dig some uh, hash rate chart with a second BTC hash rate. I'm sure I can dig it up fast. There we go. One, uh, one, nine, one, eight, half. Uh, there we go 185.89 eh right. so, so very near all-time highs 
So yes, we've recovered from the Chinese ban. We've recovered well yeah. very fast and we are already yeah. in there, as we just said. And so for people that don't know about hash rate, just quickly, it shows the overall health of the network. A higher hash rate means there's more active miners on the network and people investing in uh, processing transactions and earning Bitcoin. And so a higher rate tends to suggest uh, a healthy uh, Bitcoin network. So potential attack would be less and less possible or more yeah. and more expensive for the attacker. The, yeah, the bigger think, the hash rate is. Certainly, certainly. Yes, it, it, it shows security as well. That's a good point. We want to talk about the high, yeah, the interest high rate. The Fed, yeah. Um, so when we started, this is our fourth chat, uh, David, uh, on your channel. And the first chat, it was the big week uh, was in January where Powell was going to, or the Fed was going to have a meeting mm -hmm. and concerns were they were turning hawkish and raising interest rates. Okay. So I think this week or next will be the March meeting. I think it's March 13th. Right? Uh, March around, around the mid March, not so sure if it's 13, but around the mid. Yes. And so the discussions you and I had then was, you know, uh, are they going to raise rates a lot, you know, up to 2% or is it kind of a head fake? In other words, are they just talking about raising rates and they actually will not oh. do it? Okay. Yeah. Um, my, opinion was, my opinion was they were talking about raising rates, but they hadn't. Uh, so I was thinking, you know, they might be faking it again. Um, and we talked about in 2018 that they'd raised rates and then quickly reversed it. Yeah. And so, so anyways, an update for people that are following that story is it looks like Powell is saying it's going to be a 0.25 rate increase on the 13th, uh, not 0.5. Which okay. is excellent news because we've been talking about this uh, with relation to the S&P 500 and that is related to the cryptocurrencies. We've been talking numerous times about how, uh, uh, how related how uh uh you know how connected are the s p 500 and bitcoin how correlated these are and right. we are going to have a look at the, what the s p 500 has been doing so yeah. ever since when we started doing this uh, this podcast we are more or less declining and even from before we started doing this podcast i don't remember when i drew this red circle it might have been somewhere in january i don't yeah, remember it was, when it was your first our first video so it would have been january yeah it was even before that the circle was already present uh, on the video so i i drew it like before that uh, hmm. so it must have been in january or even the last year and the circle right. was hit although it was not closed in the circle so i right. mean i am not convinced i am i i told you also a few days ago i'm not convinced that um we will not revisit the circle once more and do a proper daily close there mm -hmm. i'm not convinced about it to be honest right. <laughs> in a very right. in the upcoming days you know it has to happen right. soon so uh, connecting the Fed, um, mm -hmm. especially with, with the Russia-Ukraine war yeah, we'll talk um, about it. And, yeah. and the impact on energy prices, mm -hmm. um, seems to me that it looks like the Fed is going to be softer. They're going to be more uh -huh. dovish uh, mm -hmm. this year. Um, and Powell's comments seem to be, I forget the wording. If you go back to that article, it has the, uh -huh. the wording. Mm -hmm. um, it says at the bottom. Um, uh, but the, we, we are prepared to move more aggressively if inflation does not abate as fast as expected. Yeah. Um, that's the that's the end of the yeah, screenshot. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so he, some of the words he was using seemed to me to be he was sort of hedging his bets. He's mm -hmm. definitely not saying they're going to raise rates a lot this year. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, 0.25 is almost insignificant in terms of the real cost of money, right? Um, yes. So anyways, it seems they're softening, which could be good for stocks. Could be, um, and could and, be good for Bitcoin. Could, yeah, yeah. Could be good for Bitcoin. However, once again, what Bitcoin is going to do is going to depend on S&P 500. 
and uh, if it declines, if if my red circle really is gonna be hit once again, in that case, this is if scenario, in that case, we will test the lows once again. It I do. Uh, it does not mean we're gonna break dramatically low, but the low was for, was so far 33k. But yeah, we, that might be tested once again. So let's leave one one more red circle on the Bitcoin chart today. Right. So that would be for the S&P 500. And now let's have a look at the at the gold and US dollar index. That's gonna be interesting. So let's start with gold. Yeah. So it's looking good. I mean, it's breaking out here. This is on weekly uh, right now. 1992 it hasn't been that high since uh what's the peak 2020 there, since the post corona uh, shock yeah uh, the all-time high of gold was the summer 2020 that was the you know uh the world was in shock from the from the pandemic and people flew so how high did it go 2000 uh the, the total all-time high 2073 75 and then just drop back to 2011. If you drop back the chart a little bit, pull it back, okay. you'll see you'll see we had in 2011, we had 1900. Uh, 1900. So yeah, we're sort let's of switch to monthly. Yeah. Let's so you can see. Yeah, you can. That's a good chart. So you mm -hmm. can see we did test around 1900 in 2011. Uh, that was 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it's taken a very long time to get back there. It I did. mean, the gold bug. The gold bugs uh, were, thought we were breaking into five thousand dollars in two thousand eleven, and that that did not happen. Um, well, they thought the same last year as well. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, it um, does look good now. I think we will go into the two thousands. I, mean, I, I don't think know, we, so too. Yeah. What 2,200, 2,300? Um, uh, definitely not five times five five thousand. No, I don't think no, it's going to. I go to don't 5, think so. No. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, but um, just like you said, yeah, I agree. Around twenty four hundred, maybe. I mean, it should be that high, right? Um, now the gold bulls, right? Mm -hmm. The thing is, I, I I still think they're going to be disappointed. That's my call. Is I think it's going to hit maybe so. twenty two hundred or twenty three hundred, and then it's going to stall and might even pull back. I um, think that that might be the all time high overall for the gold, even. Right. Right. Of course. So remember yeah. that if there are gold bugs listening, I mean, I, I was positive <laughs> on gold for many, many years. So I understand the arguments. Um, one issue, well, some of the issues I've learned over the years, um, despite the fact that Bitcoin is taking a lot of that market as mm -hmm. a digital gold sort of a proxy, but even if you took Bitcoin out of it, um, as gold price rises, you do see more gold supply come onto the market. You have a lot of miners that are uh, producing gold at less than capacity. And what that means is they can quickly ramp up gold production mm -hmm. and increase the supply as the price rises. Of course, as the supply rises, the price gains to decline. Are, are softened, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the case. Where, where with Bitcoin, you have a fixed supply. It's based on software. You can't be messed with. And uh, yeah. irrespective of demand increases, supply does not change. And that's the beauty of Bitcoin. Um, so uh, we'll see, but definitely, you know, in a very short term, could we get another twenty percent up on gold? Likely, we will, because you're going to break out, you're going to hit all-time highs, you're going to get a new cycle promoting it, and um, yeah, you roughly know, twenty percent. That's also that would be also my call. Yeah, um, and it'll look good, and then you'll get the news cycle talking about gold more and more. But I think it's going to fade. I think um, so too. Uh, of course, it depends on the macro event later this decade. And we will talk at the end of this podcast about the possibility of the Third World War and uh, well, uh, what that would uh, probably mean or what we think it would mean for cryptocurrencies. And we will we can also include gold. Sure. And talk about it. Sure. What what would happen or what we think would happen. Okay, so let's leave that uh, for the end of our podcast. And let's now switch to the uh, US dollar index, which is DXY. And this is going to be now interesting because 
<laughs> I had these lines there again, and <laughs> it seems strong, like yeah. it seems like they might work. And this red line, that's the monthly line. So I would expect, or my call would be that we're gonna make a monthly close around this uh, red line. As for the monthly, however, we are 24 more days to go. And right. the blue line, that would be weekly. So I could expect or see or think that we are going to make a weekly close somewhere around the blue line and we're approaching. Right. So of course, the US dollar is a flight to safety currency. Something like gold. A it's yep. a risk off risk asset off. similar to gold mm -hmm. um, in the sense that it is the safest um, fiat, fiat currency. Yeah. And um, in times of war mm -hmm. um, and uncertainty, there, there is mm -hmm. often um, a flight to cash generally, right? People will sell uh, risk assets and go to cash, and often they will park their money in US dollars. Mm -hmm. Important thing to say as well, as for my lines go, that once we hit these my targets, which we are hitting, then what I would think, uh, it, I can speculate, of course, this is not a financial advice, then I'm speculating that we will actually see a pretty significant decline. And as we've been talking about uh, on, on my channel, on in our podcast, we've been talking about it uh, for a couple of times, when the US dollar goes down, uh, that's a good, that's generally a very good new for Bitcoin and the right. cryptocurrencies. Right. And why do you think it's going to go down from that top blue line? From the technical perspective, <laughs> just, so that, just how is that line drawn just from this, from, mm. does okay. it go back further? I no, forget. it does not. No, but it goes from 2016. So over the past few years, right? So. Uh, this is, I've noticed that the US dollar, I have a different chart as well, which goes further. I don't have the lines here, but this chart goes further. Yeah, and, right. You drew from there, I think. Uh, from there? there are, there, there are more, there are more than one, uh, DXY charts and right. the, 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 the chart where I have my lines, it only goes as far as, as, uh, 1986. So then I dig up, I dug up the second chart, which goes further, which goes as far uh -huh. as like 1968 and it shows a little bit more. And what I've noticed that there are some kind of macro cycles for the U S dollar. Okay. Some kind of right. macro cycles. And in between in these macro cycles, there are some kind of a micro cycles, which last just like a right. year or two right. or three. And the macro cycles, they last approximately what, seven, eight years. And based on all of this together, I drew these lines. And based on that, uh, I would dubi dubiously speculate, I suppose that's a good term or what I'm doing. I would dubiously speculate that we are going to actually come to this area and we will then uh, reverse and actually we will then test this line. Then after that, that's a question mark. Then we will talk about it. Hopefully we will be still doing mm -hmm. these podcasts. Hopefully we will survive till then. And, uh, and uh, then we can talk about what then, but even in, even, even the decline to this blue line, that's already a pretty good, uh, I think pretty good news for Bitcoin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and crypto. So that would be for the US dollar. And is there anything else we want to do an update for? Oh, yes. Russian ruble. ruble. Russian ruble. Yeah. Oh, all right. This is going to be a nasty chart. So USD slash rubble, ruble. This is going to be a very nasty chart. Uh, so this is the US dollar strengthening. Maybe if you is... reverse it. If you want to reverse it, okay. I mean, either one, but uh, it, flip it around. Yes, sure, we can do that. Uh, yeah, we yeah. can flip it. There you yeah. go. <laughs> so well, this is the Russian ruble valued against the US dollar. Um, and you see, well, it's, it's been bad for a very long time. <laughs> yes, but uh, always mm, with the sanctions. But it really fell yeah. off uh, in the last 10 days um, at yeah. the far right there, yeah. Yes, and if you go even further into 90s, oh my God, right. I even don't know what this was about. It looks like the biggest uh, the decline collapse of the, of the Soviet Union. 
1997. Ah, uh, 1990. No, that uh. was that was sooner. No, no, no. This was 1998. This was 1998. I don't. It looks like the biggest decline of ruble was actually 90s. I didn't. The government see that might before. have. Been, maybe the government devalued on their own, like voluntarily. Anyways, that's maybe. a different story. That's we can talk yeah. about that a different time. But you can see in the last 10 days, it's lost about 30, 35 percent of its value. Um, um, that's pretty mind blowing, right? Yeah, it's even more, even more than that, even over 40. 40. Mm -hmm. So it's approaching 50. Any. I don't think most people have gone through their currency devaluating 40% in 10 days. <laughs> even yeah. even in countries like Argentina, that's quite extreme in 10 days. It is. Um, it annually, is. Uh, you know, in, in some South American countries, they'll lose 30% over a year, but not in a 10-day period. So quite mind-blowing. And it shows how weak, um, you know, second uh, tier two and tier three currencies are like so um except for the euro the yen us dollar mm -hmm. uh chinese yuan if you're if you're in a, a weaker currency you know if you're in in the turkish lira you're in oh, the yes. russian ruble you're in the argentine uh the, the bolivar um you're in an incredibly vulnerable and risky position even if you hold cash right yeah um, people tend to think cash is somehow safe versus other investments, but but not if you're holding a, a weak fiat. Yeah. And so imagine the shock of a semi-wealthy uh, young man in, in Russia holding, oh, yes. ruble, ho holding rubles for some reason, mm -hmm. and then suddenly they are 30%, 40% less, less purchasing power. Um, yeah. So that's what happened. Well, uh, so this is obviously all related to the current military conflict. I'm going to show the map again for those of you who are new. I am in the country of Slovakia uh, and Curtis is, do we want to share? Uh, sure. I think, yeah, I we, think we shared that uh, a couple of times already. So yeah. Curtis is currently in Japan. But I am in the country of Slovakia, which borders with Ukraine, so uh, it's uh, it's not a comfortable time for me uh, because, of course, there is a lots of fear that uh, there it might escalate into a fully fledged World War Three, which would be NATO versus Russia. If the if that war be, uh, erupts, it would be the World War Three, and it would uh, most likely escalate sooner or later into a nuclear conflict as well so mm -hmm. of course there is a at the moment it's not the most comfortable place to be you're uh, very close there aren't you the country yes that's what i'm saying there is a border with ukraine yes and have you, you've had a lot of um ukrainian refugees oh and yes that is a humanitarian crisis and uh Oh, yeah, the country, the Slovakia is fairly small, very small country. Uh, overall population around 5 million. The capital city is only half a million. So if there is a right, if Ukraine is a huge country of 40 million, if there is just 1 million of your refugees coming to Slovakia, it's literally like 25% of the population. Oh, so wow. it's like, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's actually, you know, a trouble. Like... Um, it's just uh, too many people coming at the same time and and uh, it's a crisis. It's a crisis of, on its own. Yeah. But of course, the most important thing is not to escalate the, the military conflict. Right. That crisis will be handled. And eventually, once the, the conflict ends, uh, many people, most of them will return back and uh, start rebuilding uh, the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, yeah, um, do we want to talk about it or I think there is not even need to talk about it because everybody is talking about it. Maybe we should talk about the Russian banks removed from the SWIFT and we should relate it to the Canadian Canadian bank freezes, which took right. the, the world by surprise, actually. Right. So, um, yeah, of course, um, the West uh, and NATO is not intervening in the war. Uh, yes. Hopefully it stays that troops. way. Hopefully. Okay, so they're arming, they're sending weapons and uh, and support, oh, uh, yeah. military support, what they yes. call lethal support, which is an interesting word, but uh, weapons. Uh, but they're not, they've said up until now, they're not going to uh, 
support with troops. They're not going to create a no-fly yeah. zone. The no, Ukrainian no, that would be uh, Zelensky, yeah, he's asking for them to uh, create a no-fly zone over the country. Yes. But the concern is that a NATO jet would shoot down a Russian jet or vice versa, and there that would be would direct be war. warfare. Okay, that so be that's war. not happening. What the West is doing Good. is they are sanctioning, and mm -hmm. a big part of this is trying to freeze the wealth of Russian oligarchs, uh, rich business people, and. Uh -huh. One piece of that was to remove some Russian banks from the, the World SWIFT system. Um, for people that don't know that, SWIFT is a global clearance channel or mechanism. It's a payment mechanism for clearing global trade, including Russian oil being sold to other countries in the world. So um, SWIFT is also for bank-to-bank -bank clearance. Um, if you're not on the SWIFT system, your bank is almost insignificant on a global scale. And so it's a pretty big thing to remove a Russian bank from SWIFT, and they've actually done this. Um, I would like to say that this, uh, um, this, uh, the scale of the sanctions against Russia are unprecedented. I think to this scale, it's never happened before in the history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So no one really knows uh, where that's going to lead or what's going to happen next in Russia. Nobody really knows. It's a wait and see scenario. However, there are other payment system. Russians have their own payment system. Chinese have their own payment system, I think. So uh, they're going to switch to a different payment system, but they will not be able to uh, interact with the Western uh, economies, however. Right. So, um, yeah, the SWIFT, um, you did see a spike, I believe, in Bitcoin in the Ukraine and Russia, okay, um, or at least them moving to, um, I think there was a lot of stable coin purchases, so like so, US dollar tether. You're talking about 28th of February and 1st of March, I suppose. Yeah. Now, whether that impacted days. the price that much or not, it definitely mm -hmm. was uh, PR, you know, it was... Um, it was, let's just say it was noticed by the Bitcoin community. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. And whether it directly um, was the reason that the price went up to 44,000, we don't know, but it, it's a significant issue. Um, if you add that to the Canadian, uh, Mr. Justin Trudeau oh. threatening to freeze Canadian yeah, tell bank us accounts. About it. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, there was a trucker protest in Canada and um, people were funding the truckers through like um, uh, GoFundMe websites. Mm -hmm. And Justin Trudeau said, if you're found doing that, they would freeze your bank account. So apparently there is no free speech in Canada. And um, that's the, shocking. That's the idea shocking. Of, of someone having their finances frozen for disagreeing with the government um, is uh, an absolutely new thing. So um, if you're talking about the, the sanctions on Russia being absolutely you know, uh, new, uh, mm -hmm. you can also say that what Justin Trudeau threatened or, or, or actually enacted in Canada was also um, breakthrough in a very bad way. Oh, yes. So we've had two big incidents that got uh, global uh, news coverage, um, you know, the, the, the removal of Russian banks from SWIFT and the Canadian government threat to seize private bank accounts. Both of these are a threat on financial sovereignty. You could use the word financial sovereignty to describe the ability to um, have just have your own money and do what you want with it. And um, this is a major use case for Bitcoin, is that they cannot sanction you. If you have your Bitcoin on a private wallet that's off an exchange, you can do private peer-to-peer -peer payments at your will. And it's a major... Uh, the term unconfiscatable is often overlooked by Bitcoin proponents. It's not discussed, but even Western countries are, and Western citizens are starting to realize that this is a big issue. Oh, yes. It also sparks the question, how free actually is the West? Because this conflict is from the Western perspective through the Western media is portrayed as the as the conflict between the free world and the autocratic oppression. However, what's just happened in Canada, it actually sparks the question, and rightfully so, how free is the West actually, really? Yeah, I think so. So <laughs> that's that. How uh, 
yeah and the cryptocurrencies um uh also as for the little uh, little spike that we had on the 28th of february and 1st of march i think that the russian oligarchs must have seen this coming and i think that the, the people in russia who move the markets who have enough purchasing power to move the markets i think they have they must have expected something like those something like this so they have been prepared i don't think sure. they're gonna panic enter the market but uh, the simple fact is that the russia is legalizing cryptocurrencies as we speak previously it had a very negative stance like china towards the crypto and mm -hmm. but it's changed it's changed mm -hmm. its stance and it's legalizing it as we speak so ordinary russian users will be able to and will start or are starting to get into crypto of course not through the western uh, uh centralized exchanges that have banned them but for russia it's going to be very easy to create their own centralized exchanges and plus there are other means how to uh, how to acquire crypto as well right so russia will enter cryptocurrencies is entering nonetheless right and that's a that's a huge market still you know 150 million people even with the ruble falling um still still you know it's a huge economy right so all right um we've just talked about all our all our topics usual topics perhaps <laughs> mm -hmm. and now let's talk about the the most well spicy but not making jokes about it but uh, mm. the most spicy topic will cryptocurrency survive world war three so what do right. you think so i guess you're being a little bit facetious right because it's not likely to happen right okay um they're like yeah. they're, they're i don't nato is not going to engage russian troops um, yeah fortunately putin, putin does not want to fight nato no he can hardly handle the ukraine so again, it's a lot of talk and no action. Um, is there a chance of something happening? Uh, perhaps, in the future? But, uh, in yeah, the future, or, yeah. Later this you... decade, or oh, the next decade. Sure. Yeah, I think the biggest risk to that happening would be Putin being really cornered and not oh, Russia yes. not seeing a way out. So yes. I actually think the West the West is is the ones being careless here. It's very easy oh, to yeah. say that, that Putin is being careless by attacking Ukraine. Of course yes. he is. It's dumb. He's killing oh, yes. people. That are bad. Yeah, but definitely. Um, the re if you look at who's actually threatening a World War Three scenario, it's far greater. It was your Ukrainian um, independence and NATO and how the West is acting. Because, um, you know, if you notice, Kiev is only 750 kilometers from Moscow. It's very close. Westerners, people in America, Canada don't realize how close it is. Um, for context, 750 kilometers, that's the same as Florida to Washington, D.C. So from Florida, Washington, D.C. is the same as Ukraine to Moscow, Kiev to Moscow. So if China put a military base in Florida, what do you think the U.S. would do? <laughs> or if Russia put a military look base Look at the distance between Cuba Florida. Mm -hmm. Look at Florida to Washington, D.C. Yeah. That's the same distance, 750 kilometers from the border there. So can you imagine Russia or China having a military base or if the entire state of Florida was uh, funded by the Chinese or the Russians? I mean, of course, America would attack, right? Yeah. There's no way yes. they would let. No. Um, they, so, I mean, it's a bit silly. Um, I'm not defending Russian actions, but I think- No, it's, me neither. It, it is also very strange that Ukraine thought that they could have uh, NATO membership or cruise missiles or uh, whatever, um, to so close to Moscow. Um, I think it's been a failure of their their efforts to be diplomatic. Uh, clearly, they, they need Moscow as an ally. And I understand why that might not be possible. And there's a lot of history there. I'm not an expert in history. But even even despite that, it seems like the Ukraine pushed too hard. And that's why they've been invaded. And um, uh, Russia is a dictatorship. But at the same time, yes. It does have a right to exist. Oh yes, yeah, and, yeah. and um, to defend it's, itself. Yeah, and um, so I think the West is the one that's risking World War Three, not Putin. I think so too. Yeah, and the hypocrisy and ignorance in the Western media is is it's evil. Um, 
People talk about Putin being evil. I think CNN is far more evil than Putin, or maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but um, evil is when you lie to people and say there's only one side to this story yeah. and that uh, Ukraine is 100% the victim and Moscow is 100% the aggressor. Um, evil is when you censor, when you censor all other media except yours. Yeah, and the West is 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 embarrassing. I mean, it, it, the general Western um, uh, public relations on this that it's it's uh, that Russia would not be threatened by Poland, <laughs> uh, Ukraine, you know, and the expansion of NATO that way. Remember, in Ukraine, they also they want to put uh, telecommunications and they want to put probably fighter jets in there and they want to put Western intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh cia operatives i'm sure and it's just too much i think it's just too much yeah so so anyways um world war three i don't think it's going to happen if it does yeah. happen i think it's more because of nato action not putin um now what happens to uh if if, if world war three breaks out i mean everything's done right forget crypto um yeah <laughs> you know oil prices would skyrocket and and world yeah. economies would crash so i don't think crypto would even matter at that point all the superpowers uh, would just yeah. cease to exist because right. everything would be nuked yeah so maybe we should maybe that's too extreme it maybe the discussion is well what what could happen this year let's say it's not world war three but let's say things get worse in russia which they likely will um even if Putin uh, removes his troops from the Ukraine, which he's not going to, but let's say that was the best case, mm -hmm. he would still feel very threatened and there's still going to be massive issues. Of course, he's damaged his reputation even more. So, so we have a very shaky world economy if we have a, a scared Russia, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that said, there even without a World War III scenario, you still have some major risks to... Uh, to the world economy and crypto, of course. Yes, yes, we do. However, uh, uh, I see parallel. I see massive parallel to to uh, you know which month. I think you will guess it. Which month to the March twenty twenty? I remember March twenty twenty. How everybody also around me was scared to the core. People were massively purchasing like flour sugar salt water <laughs> toilet paper storing yeah. you know whole cellars with all these supplies people were panicking panicking maybe even more than they are right now or similarly so and people right. were thinking that it's just going to like everything is going to just uh, you know go to shit uh, and right. what happened with markets and uh, you know it dropped out of the panic but then it recovered as we all know it was the the those that bought in march 2020 actually became uh, well excessively successful in the markets let's say that way and right. but what happened on the fundamental level was that the innovation the innovations or the innovations got speeded speeded up the development of the innovations speeded up and innovations are also blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies but not just that it's also ai it's the robotics it's the gene sequencing uh, dna sequencing i mean it's mm -hmm. it's lots of other things everything got speed up and i think that the, the, the innovations can actually offer some solution to to get out of this yeah. mess as well yeah, the, the, the world is in and i think that this conflict that is happening is gonna do the same i think it's going to again accelerate the innovations right at the moment I... it looks dire but still right yeah interesting um so yeah, I guess the risks are energy and uh, another one is like things like wheat. I think Ukraine mm -hmm. produces a lot of wheat. Oh, yes. Um, one and of the so there could exporters. be, I don't know how that affects food prices or food supply, um, but I've heard rumors that the, the impact on the econ world economy could be uh, pretty bad. Um, that's even if things don't get worse here um, yeah. in the war sense. So. Um, so uh that could be bad for crypto in the short term does bitcoin decouple at some point 
uh, does uh, the S&P go down and Bitcoin hold or go up at some point? We haven't seen that yet. So that's just speculation and kind of uh, hopeful, wishful thinking, right? Yes, um, but you know, I am fairly sure it's not going to decouple. I'm fairly sure it's not going to decouple from the, the SPX, from the S&P 500. Also, I'm reminding the people that I have my quote unquote magic chart, as I call it, which is a correlation between S&P 500 and the Bitcoin. And that magic and that my magic chart is actually showing a pretty healthy reversal as well. So Bitcoin is stronger than SPX S&P 500 recently. Ever since January, Bitcoin is stronger. So as that graph rises, it means Bitcoin's getting relatively stronger. It's getting this. relatively stronger. Yes, of course, this is what looks like like at the beginning of the ascending wedge, but yeah. which is bearish. Ascending wedges are not good news. But remember that we have had we had descending wedge for a, like a large a large period of time. We had a descending right. wedge for months. So uh, it's not like even if this is an ascending wedge, this is a slow chart. I think it can still go on for, for weeks or months. Before. Can you explain the red line at the bottom, the big thick red line? <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that I don't even remember when. Okay. <laughs> this I think I might have asked about that before. Oh yeah, but... I know, I know, I know now. I see this fat red line. It's the very, very top, the pinpoint top of the December 2017. Okay, which was the peak peak of the Bitcoin bubble because that where was where Bitcoin was much stronger than S and P five hundred in twenty seventeen. But both were rising again because it's very heavily correlated and always has been. And if somebody right. tells you that uh, it's not correlated, I think that it's not entirely accurate. But so this fat red line is the very pinpoint top of the December twenty seventeen, and I have that line there because last summer this line worked because when we dropped in May, we touched it, then we closed on it. And then on weekly, then we closed daily on it. And then we closed weekly on it. Then we okay. closed weekly on it. So, so, okay. So Bitcoin is, is, is sort of getting stronger in comparison to the S and P over the last three months. My chart shows that and it will also it also implies that there might be a bullish breakout uh, fairly soon, actually. Because right. then it's it's just wait Bitcoin at the moment based on my chart, Bitcoin just waits when S&P 500 finally bottoms out, which might have bottomed out, might not. I would still I'm not convinced that it has. So if it comes to the 4000 right. or so, I think that's what Bitcoin is waiting for. Right, right. It, it makes sense because as the S&P bottoms, traders get more bullish and more confident and uh, turn up their risk profile and then get back into Bitcoin. It, it makes sense. Well, I would actually maybe I'm not sure which traders you mean, but if the if we go lower on S&P, I think majority will be even more bearish, I think. And people will be even more scared, which will be bullish. They will be shorting more again. So I'm yeah. Hmm. No, I was just saying that it, as Bitcoin is, is still a risk on asset, uh -huh. as sentiment strengthens, once the bottom is found, uh -huh. Of course, stock uh -huh. uh, traders start uh, making money again, okay. uh -huh. and, um, and then they and, and with that money they buy Bitcoin, or with that money mm -hmm. they take more risk in Bitcoin, or with that that confidence, new players come in and say, like any money that's on the sidelines, right? So it's waiting to see a bottom in the S and P, and waiting to see a bottom in Bitcoin. As soon as that's established, one triggers the other, right? Yeah. Um, the other thing is. You're not going to be buying Bitcoin if you're losing money in your in your stock account, right? Because you're 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 ne you're negative. You're 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 down. You're you have a negative mood, and um, you're in a defensive mode. So um, it's just very you know basic. People don't want to invest when they're waking up and their stocks are down twenty percent, and so it, it makes sense. Yes. So um, um. The last in our last podcast we did before the before the initiation of the conflict on the Ukraine. Our last podcast was on 21st of February 2022. 
And uh, at the end of the podcast, we said to each other, to one another, that in our next podcast, we will know uh, how the, because, you know, the Russians seemed like they were preparing for uh, for invasion or, right. or just attack. So we said that in two weeks, we will know. So now we know. Right. And now we know, unfortunately, yeah. And we're gonna say that in in the next few weeks when we'll meet, which is going to be 21st of March, 2022, on our next, in our next uh, podcast, we will know where the bottom of S&P 500 was. You think so? I think so. I think so that soon. I think so. Why is that? Because I think it's still the uncertainty in S&P 500 still has to do that the Fed meeting hasn't happened yet. Okay. And also, it also had to do with the people didn't, people also waiting, what all sanctions are gonna be there on Russia. And that's, it, I think it's close to, to full scale, like there can't be even more sanctions because everything is sanctioned now. So even also that has to reach its, its, its top, you know, the sanction it has to reach its, its top. Well, and also within two weeks, I imagine you'll have had Kiev will have capitulated or not, uh, maybe two to four weeks from now, right? Uh, I would rather say it's going to be four weeks because with all of shitload, shitload amount of weapons that the West has supplied to Ukraine, it's just, I can't imagine that in, well, let's see. I mean, I would be happy. Okay. I would be happy to be wrong this time. I'm just... If then in the next week, if it's all over, I would be so happy. But unfortunately, I don't think so. I think it'd be over, but I think you may, we may have an outcome oh. where we we are we are sure either Russia has won or they've lost or okay. yeah. perhaps there's a ceasefire. Okay, um, maybe. I think maybe one Russia. one thing that might happen is Russia takes that corridor from Crimea to Don Donbats the. And they just take that land and they just let Kiev stand. I don't know if that's possible, but um, they may only want to go from Crimea to uh, and build a land corridor, right? Mm-hmm. So they, this Mariupol, you see Mariupol on the right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That town is under attack right now. And then Donetsk, right? So mm-hmm. if they take Mariupol, they have uh, a land uh, channel straight to uh, Crimea and the Black Sea. I think that was a major strategic goal for them. Yes. Um, They might be happy to keep that and then let Kiev on its own. I don't know if that's possible, but um, uh, anyways, who knows? That might get resolved. In the next two weeks. Well, not in the next two weeks, no, but but a lot's going to happen, let's just say, in the next two weeks. A lot's going to happen, yes. Um, Hopefully it's not bloody and hopefully... Hopefully. Anyways, okay. So thank you very much, Curtis, for your time. Always a pleasure. Thank you. We'll talk in a couple weeks. We will. So uh, have a nice week.